You never know what makes a show successful. If you could identify the ingredients and separate them, then you'd be a genius. But no one, nobody knows. It's a combination of factors. It's great actors, great writing, great uh, directors, great producers. We've been very lucky. Disco Pigs. I had done the play Disco Pigs. That was my first ever job. And then three years later, they made a movie of the play. And I played that character. And it wasn't the first film I'd done, but it was the first film I did, I suppose, that people took any notice of. And uh, I have a lot of affection for that character because it was the first role I ever played professionally. I think it's a, an, an exploration of, it, of a highly dysfunctional relationship, you know, between these kids who are not yet adults, really. They're, it's their 17th birthday and the relationship had been platonic until then and he obviously wants to make it something else and and uh, I think it spins him off into some sort of a breakdown. We never really pathologized it because we didn't want to reduce what the character was going through to, to that. But uh, yeah, he's, he, he's kind of bereft by the other character, Runt leaving him and uh, it sends him into this spiral of kind of of, of sort of violence and self-destruction, really. Jesus. Darling, just, just relax, will ya? It's okay. Hey, I'm fucking awful, Mr. Crabby Balls. Darling, okay, we don't. <laughs> It's very sad at the ending because he, he acquiesces to his own death because I think he knows that he will only set her free through his own demise. Very sad and beautiful, and yeah, we shot it on a beach around here actually. But it's beautifully observed piece of writing in the theatre by Enda Walsh, and uh, and I think we made a good stab at it as a film, you know. Twenty eight days later. In twenty eight days later, I think Danny Boyle had seen Disco Pigs, and I think that's what when I got the the audition, or it was like a one of five auditions. I I think he put me through about five auditions for that. I mean, I'd been you know. Shallow Grave and Train Spotting were two definitive films for me growing up. I, you know, before I ever wanted, contemplated becoming an actor, those two films were highly significant for, for me. And, you know, Danny is, you know, one of the best directors in the world. So it was a huge thing for me to get that role. He's, he's got an amazing energy. It's kind of infectious uh, how enthusiastic he is about every aspect of making a film, you know, he's totally in love with uh, the process of filmmaking and um, he never sits down, he knows everyone's name, he's an incredibly uh, thoughtful director and the notes that he gives are, they can change your whole performance, you know, and he really pushed me on that film because I hadn't, I hadn't done much film acting at that stage and we shot it in the summer of uh, 2001, so we'd go out really, really, really early, like four in the morning, just pre-dawn and then just as it was the dawn was breaking they would ask people to stop walking and then the art department would run in and just dress it really really quickly and they had cameras all over the all over the place, but they were these domestic cameras with the little, do you remember the ones with the little tiny little cartridges? It was before HD or anything like that. DV, the good old days of DV. And uh, so everyone could shoot them and they just had loads and loads of footage. And we got it, like kind of miraculously, we got this footage. And I think maybe they painted out like lights or stuff, but it's all in camera, you know? And that character reaches this place where he, he goes from this sort of like, very benign, terrified bike courier to this sort of 
vengeful kind of, um, you know, a, a man who's not afraid to take life. And, and I think it's because he realizes that this, the future that he has rests with these two women and he has to protect them in order to survive. It was a, uh, it was a, a prosthetic, prosthetic head. I think they used like light cheese for the eyes or something like that. Maybe they didn't, but I like to remember that fact. It's a brilliant script by Alex Garden. You know, when you put an ordinary man in these extraordinary situations, how do you react? And that's why I think why people identify with the movie because it was like a reimagining of the zombie genre, but also a kind of a, an examination of, of what, 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 what would one do in that sort of scenario? And he, it's fight or flight thing. The Batman trilogy, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. I'd seen Chris's movies um, prior to Batman Begins and I was a huge fan of them. You know, Following and Memento. About 10 of us went up for Batman. And uh, I, I was aware that I was clearly not the right material for Batman. It, I didn't think, uh, so I did a screen test and the whole suit and everything. And, uh, but Chris said, I, there might be another part. So, so we met and we chatted uh, and, and, and I, and I, and I, play, I ended up playing Scarecrow in the end, yeah. you <laughs> He's one of the oldest um, villains in the in the series, so they gave me some one of some of the early, very early comics, which I read. Even though it's a huge, you know, big studio picture, big studio production, it's only Chris, his cameraman, uh, and the first AD who are around when you're shooting. It's a very private, very calm, very quiet set. There's no monitors, there's no video village, there's none of that stuff, and. So even though it's a huge movie, it feels like a, an independent film. And I, I've always felt that the only difference between those films is the resources you have, and it's how you uh, utilize the resources. So Chris is very confident in delivering scale, but also he concentrates very much on performance. And with that character, we wanted to show the two, he's supposed to be this sort of uh, psychiatrist working in an asylum, and he's you know quite amenable and clever and all of that. Yeah, Dr. Crane, I can't take it anymore. It's all too much. The walls are closing in. Blah, blah, blah. Not a couple of days of this food. It'll be true. What do you want? I want to know how you're going to convince me to keep my mouth shut. About what? You don't know anything. And then he's this, this other sort of, uh, you know, this, I guess he's their, he's a comic book villain. Would you like to see my mask? I use it in my experiments. I'm um, probably not very frightening to a guy like you, but these crazies, they can't stand it. So when did the nut take over the nut house? They scream and they cry. Which is your day now. You could have fun and you could be a bit broad and that was fun for me to do. I'd never done anything like that. You know? I didn't expect to be, uh, expect to come back. It was wonderful fun to reprise a character. Up until that point, I'd never reprised a character. You know? And uh, there was a joke on set that he's just the, you know, the character that refuses to die. He's still alive, out there <laughs> somewhere. You are Philip Striver, executive vice president of Dagon Industries, who for years has been living off the blood and sweat of people less powerful than him. Paul Bain, I'm, I am one of you. Bain has no authority here. This is merely a sentencing hearing. Now, choice is yours. Exile or death. It's exile. It's old. That one scene, Chris sent me the script, but I deliberately didn't want to read the script. I just want to read that one scene because I wanted to see the film and enjoy the film without having read it. So I didn't read it. So I came in and I didn't know what this was about or what, where, what context it had or anything like that. But I just did the scene. Death or exile? Frank, the 
If you think we're going out onto that ice willingly, you have another thing coming. Death, then. Looks that way. Very well. Death! By exile. I remember trying to keep it secret. I, it was so hard trying to keep it secret, you know? Uh, people just love a spoiler. Everyone kept asking. I think we kept it secret. I don't, I can't remember. Inception. Chris called me up and said this, uh, that there was a role in there in the script and, and he sent me the script and I read it this time and uh, it was a challenging read, you know, you, it was one of those scripts you had to read several times to figure out the sort of vernacular of it and, um, and it was challenging making it because just trying to figure out where you were all the time and the structure of the piece. But Chris had been living with that story I think for about 10 years before he got to make it and to make that sort of a story on that sort of a scale was was incredible. And for it to do so well, again, as a very, very sophisticated and not easy uh, blockbuster, you know, it just shows you never underestimate your audience, you know, because the audience are so clever and will go with you. The character, you know, has this kind of, um, emotional catharsis in the middle of the film, which was very important for the story and very important for me performance-wise. And I got to act with Pete Postlewaite, you know, who would have been one of my acting heroes and that sequence and that scene. And if you work with actors of that level, uh, it, it's really, and with directors of that level, you know, you, you're, you're expected to, to get there. How you get there, I don't know. It, it's some sort of weird alchemy, but it happens, and and we and we got there, and, and you know, it also took we took our time with it because it needed to have that emotional wallop to it for everything else to make sense. So uh, that was a good day. Again with Chris, you know, it's predominantly in camera. He's he's very reluctant to use CGI unless entirely essential. Um, so that's why I think his films are so visceral and so such the, um, such kind of honesty to them, um, because most of the stuff you're seeing actually happened. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm sorry. Who did you say you were? Rod Green from marketing. That's not true at all, is it? My name is Mr. Charles. You remember me, don't you? I'm the head of your security down here. That was my first day on set, actually. I remember that was my first day on set. And remember the water and the glass tilts like that? You feel that? You've actually been trained for this, Mr. Fisher. Pay attention to the strangeness of the weather. And in order to achieve that effect, they had built a whole, the whole bar was on a gimbal that just went so it was, n again, no CGI, so they built this huge, huge set and we came on and did the scene and then the sit set just tilted as stuff went crazy. But that's the, the amount of planning and um, thought that went into that whole film, to every set, to every shot, to every sequence. That's the brilliance of Chris Nolan's imagination. You know, he, he, it's kind of staggering that that all came from his brain, you know. When the shakes the barley. Felt a great responsibility. Again, with that film, you know, I, I auditioned for Ken Loach like four or five times. They're very rigorous um, uh, auditions and a lot of 
uh, improvisations. And obviously I knew about that period of history, but not in depth, not to the extent that uh, I subsequently learned about it. Ken has got a great relationship with, with Khan. They, they, they rightfully adore his films. And uh, I mean, he's, he, he's again, a master of, of cinema, you know, a master of world cinema. So, yeah, it, it was a great privilege to play a part like that as an Irishman and then also as an actor to work with Ken Loach. He was all shot around, you know, Cork, where I'm from, in the summertime. It was, and it was a beautiful summer. It's beautifully composed shots just of the landscape and these, these men in the landscape and, uh, and all of the stories in the script are based on real life events and real life characters, but they're kind of amalgamations of those events and characters. Can you tell me, Father, how there can be a fair election in this country when the most powerful country in the world threatens war? This is not the will of the people, it is the fear of the people. How dare you talk to me in the house of God? Silence! Damien O'Donovan, you are a disgrace to the memory of your parents. Yes, get out! I don't think it had been really dealt with, the War of Independence and the Civil War, uh, cinematically like that. Generations of families in Ireland went to see that film. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very, very proud of it and sort of the message of the film. Dunkirk. Chris called me up and he said he was making this film and uh, that it was about Dunkirk. And then he sent me the script. The character doesn't have a name, the character is called Shivering Soldier, but I think that um, what the character represents is all of those men that came back from that conflict, you know, mentally destroyed. So I felt a great sort of sense of responsibility to portray the character sensitively. And uh, I did a lot of reading about it. I've played sort of characters with PTSD a couple of times, so I'm sort of familiar with it. But all the veterans that went to see that film uh, thought the whole film was very, very truthful and very representative of what sort of happened. You know? Do you want to come below? It's much warmer. It's out to wind. Here you go. Even be George. He feels safer on deck. You would too if you'd been bombed. You both. Get him some more tea, George. It wasn't warm. <laughs> it wasn't warm. But, uh, you know, I love doing that stuff. That stuff is great. Uh, and again, like the, the, the hull of the ship that I, they, they fi find me on, they'd actually built all of that. So, and, and it, was, it was like these breakers coming over it and uh, you're stood there. I think I was on a wire or something, but you're in the middle of the ocean stood on this thing and it's very, very real. And then you have to dive off and swim to the boat. And that's the way Chris gets you to that place because you're ex experiencing it. So therefore, you know, that does a lot of the work for you in terms of the performance. And it was, yeah, it was just a pleasure to work, you know, with uh, like Barry Keoghan and Mark Rylance and that, that level of, of actor again on, on Chris's films. Beaky Blinders. I think everyone that read it at the beginning knew that it was a different level of uh, television script writing. Uh, but none of us could have predicted that it, it would connect with people in such a sort of strong way. Uh, that, like the fans are really, really, really loyal. And, and we're all really, really proud. I mean, Steve Knight is a phenomenal writer. And I think he, you know, he's just, he said to me once that writing the scripts for Peaky Blinders, it's like, it comes out of him like spring water. Do you know what I mean? Because he's from Birmingham. These are stories that he was told as a kid. So uh, there's, it comes from a place of truth for him. At the same time, it's a highly, um, it's highly stylized and heightened. You know, the, the whole sort of look of the show, costumes and the haircut and the caps and the, and the music, it's, it's, it's had a life of its own and people, identify with it, you know? It's delicate, Mr. Shelby. It concerns the factory down the road at the BSA. Rumours get started. Rumours that there was a robbery. Robbery of what? Speak. 
impossible. I meant to steal me four bikes with petrol engines. I picked up the wrong fucking crate. So that's why they sent a cop from Belfast. Maybe, maybe not. Thomas, you're a bookmaker, a robber, a fighting man. You're not a fool. You sell those things to anyone. You will have. Part of the reason the show has been successful is that it's. It was a world that hadn't been explored before. You know, in America, sort of the, the, the gangster genre or the sort of story of, you know, immigrants, i.e. cowboys, you know, or, you know, the Italians in, in, in Scorsese, you know, like that's been explored and, and mythologized so effectively over deck for decades. Whereas in Britain, speaking as an Irishman, in Britain, like that hasn't been explored so much. And then that world, that industrial world of Birmingham, it was the sort of center of manufacturing in, in, in Britain and in Europe at the time. So yeah, it was like, and the, and the sound design of it is very important as well. It's just heavy industry happening everywhere, you know? And those furnaces would have been going off like that everywhere. So, but also it's visually really appealing. has this uh, very funny relationship with mortality, Tommy, and because I think the stuff that he witnessed in France, in the trenches, you know, would uh, changed him. And there are things that neither you or I could ever imagine. And uh, it was the worst job in the, in the army at that time. Being a, they call them clay kickers. It was the worst job they would, you know, they would, they would tunnel down in these, in these um, tunnels the size of your body and uh, they would pass the earth back and they would, obviously the tunnels would collapse very often and then they would, sometimes they'd be tunneling parallel to the, to the Germans, you know, and they, would, and they would break through and have these fights and it was like hand-to-hand -hand combat and so to come out of that, like Tommy comes out of that and is decorated and saved lives and done all of those things so you can see why other veterans of the war would have respect for him. I think what makes him such a dangerous adversary is that he is unafraid to die, and I think ultimately death to him might seem like some sort of release. Uh, the Black Midwinter. At some point in the near future, Mr. Churchill will want to speak to you in person, Mr. Shelby. He has a job for you. We will be in touch. Get out of the grave, Tinker. Be on your fucking way. People bring that scene up a lot as their favorite scene of the show. It's a brilliantly, brilliantly uh, written scene, brilliantly shot scene. And I remember reading it and going, I don't know, well, that's it. He's dead. I mean, how is he gonna get out of this? He's, he's, he's clearly dead. And no one predicts this sort of twist in it, who hasn't seen it before. And, they, and uh, yeah, we really spent a lot of time making that and shooting it. And, and I think because he's so close to death that he almost welcomes it. And then when he survives, it's like, fuck, I have to keep going. I have to keep going. And it was a turning point in his, his development as a character, I think. I've played him now for five, this will be the fifth series. So it's a, um, like I said, about reprising characters. I'd never done that before, but to have these roles that are extraordinarily written in such great detail, uh, and to be able to, to go back to them season after season, it's, it's been a real gift for me. And I suppose, yeah, it also, it's very personal because people can consume it however they choose, you know, in blocks, in seasons, in episodes, and you're beamed into their living room. So I feel like they have some sort of kinship or ownership or whatever that is stronger than a two hour performance in a film, you know, which eventually it, it goes out of circulation, films naturally do. Whereas television, 
people will discover it and rewatch it and keep rewatching it, and it uh, and it develops this life of its own, which is unpredictable. You know, Breakfast on Pluto. Well, I was in, uh, in love with the book, which is written by Pat McCabe. I had heard that Neil Jordan was m making the film, who was going to make the film. I was aware that there was a script, so I sort of pestered him for an audition. And I did a screen test where I kind of glammed up and, uh, you know, put on makeup and... Um, and he liked the screen test and, and, and we... And, and eventually gave me the part and we shot the movie. And again, as a character, I have deep, deep affection for, you know, because the, the, the character just wants to look pretty and find her mum, you know. So. I was born in a small town near the Irish border. I was left in a basket on a certain doorstep. You know, I saw her once, the real mother. It was in London. What'd she look like? The most beautiful girl in the town. Not many people can take the tale of Patrick Kitten parading. Kitten? After seeing Kitten? You'll not bring my retreat into disrepute, you hear me? But you don't know a soul in London. I'm looking for my mother, please. I'll eat It was a great exploration for me, you know, I mean, I had a book as one resource, I had the script as another resource. And I wanted the character to be feminine as opposed to effeminate. I think there's a difference. It was a very kind of delicate process. It took a long time to get to that sort of physically to that place and also sort of psychologically to that place. Um, but I had a great time making it, you know. It was a cast of the, the sort of who's who of Irish film, you know, and you had Liam Neeson and Brendan Gleeson and Stephen Ray. And they're, you know, actors that I have admired for years. And uh, it was, again, a very formative experience for me because it's a big, big part and a big challenge. And I, 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 had, a, I had a great time. Sunshine. Well, I've been look, really lucky to re-collaborate with certain directors over the over the course of my career, and um, so so this was also scripted by Alex Garland, and it was Danny's next film after Twenty Eight Days Later, and uh, and it, like I'd I'd never done a sci-fi thing like that. Danny had never done a sci-fi thing like that, and it was again trying to make a film that was a blockbuster, but that was a kind of. Um, that was ticking all the boxes of a blockbuster, but that was actually looking at themes a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more challenging, I suppose, thematically, than your conventional sci-fi blockbuster. Our sun is dying. Mankind faces extinction. The earth frozen in a solar winter. It was very, very, very technical, and it took a long time, all of those technical bits, Particularly the, the sequence where we're like fixing the shield, where we're outside. 89% of shield in full sunlight. Work and in those suits and things. Danny's so visually sort of uh, strong in all of his films. And we built this huge set, and uh, they had this massive wall of lights moving towards me and wind machines and all that. And I suppose in in the film, it's like the character's communion with the sun, you know, and where it moves into a kind of um, transcendental kind of thing or whatever. That sequence was, was great. And also just trying to get into that head headspace was a great challenge for me. You know, scientists are really, we should listen to scientists, question everything, you know, and that's what those guys do who are kind of like really on the sort of 
I don't know, on the edge of knowledge. But I really, really enjoyed it, again, because it was, you know, a clever and challenging uh, mainstream film, which is the kind of films that I'm attracted to, I suppose.